Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I got my partner here, Ben Dreiser. I'm Dustin Kircher with MHP Nation. We got an awesome guest on the show today. Uh, our first appraiser, which is surprising, uh, but Andy uh, Chapman is who our guest is today. And Andy's helped us out with questions uh, in the past on uh, on deals that we've been working with. And so we're excited to have Andy on here, share his experience. He's an awesome dude. Uh, lots of knowledge to learn from him. So Andy, thank you for coming on the show. Absolutely. I, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So Andy, you are with uh, CBRE right now. As we mentioned, you're a licensed appraiser, uh, and you said you started back in 2010 as a licensed appraiser. What got you into that field and made you realize this is where you wanted to go? So, you know, I had a couple of um, friends uh, who had relatives that were in were in valuation, and you know, looked into it because I was interested in getting into real estate um, from, you know different angles. And mm -hmm. this was one that, um, you know, I was attracted to. I liked the idea of, um, of, you know, being able to the report writing and, 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 and being able to drill down and become an expert in a field, um, was, was, was appealing to me. Um, and yeah, so that was kind of, kind of how it, kind of how it got me. And, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of how I got into it. And then it was, it was a few years before, as of being an appraiser, and I know most appraisers know this, that it's, it, you know, it's, it's to your benefit to specialize in a property type. And I just had the opportunity with manufactured housing. Um, it just kind of, it kind of, it was an opportunity that was available to me and I kind of took it and ran with it. Okay. And my understanding to get your appraiser's license, it, it takes a little bit, right? It takes a lot, some time. You got to have quite a bit of hours. You got to uh, basically shadow or mentor with somebody, right? Yeah, that's absolutely yeah, it's absolutely correct. You 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 know you you have a lot of there's a lot of classes you need to take up front. You in the state of Washington, I mean, there's different um, there's different uh, qualifications in different states, but for in Washington, you need to have a bachelor's degree. So you need to already have that, and then you need to go back and take a bunch of extra classes at your own at your own cost, for the most part. Um, and you and then you're going to be mentored by somebody who you're going to gain like hours um, mm -hmm. appraising that. Um, you'll get the state will certify, but it can be, it can be a bit of a, a it can be kind of a long haul that can take a couple of years. Um, and, you know, to be honest with you, the money's not great at, at the very beginning and, and it can be discouraging to folks. So, yeah. um, it, you know, but if you do stick with it, it, it can definitely be rewarding. Um, but it is, it is, it is a little challenging because, you know, you get to the end of your college degree and then you're like, Oh wait, I'm back in school. And I'm still at the bottom, <laughs> I'm at the bottom of the ladder. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and would you say that, you know, is it make more sense to join a firm like CBRE over doing it independently? Well, independently would be really tough. I think I, yeah, I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd recommend that just because if you even, you know, I'm at a national firm now, but when I started, I was at a firm um, in Lakewood, Washington, Strickland, Heisman and Haas. Mm -hmm. um, and they, you know, they took a chance on me um, to bring me in, but you know, they, they have established clients um, you know, so okay. there's a workflow yep. already, already happening that you can kind of, you can, you can become a part of, um, you know, and you'll, you'll, you'll take the, whatever they'll, whatever they'll let you work on with them. Um, and, and you, having experienced appraisers, you know, guide you along in the path that is, you know, absolutely the way, the way to go. Um, yeah. you know, get somebody with their MAI designation that, that, that's, that's willing to put in the time to spend with you, teach you the right way to do things. Um, that, that kind of guidance is is huge. I mean, there's so much that I learned in my first couple of years that I still, you know, adhere to today. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And, and then how did you make the switch to the manufactured housing communities? What pulled you in that direction? Was it somebody? Was it an opportunity? Was it some niche that you saw kind of a blue ocean for you to kind of like be a specialist in? And then how did you gain the knowledge in this asset class? Yeah. So well, when I was at Strickland, Heisman and Haas, um, I, I, um, self storage was something that kind of, that, that nobody in our office specialized in. Many fact, I think I appraised a couple of mobile home parks or assisted on them, but nothing to where I, I didn't gain any traction in it. It was just kind of a couple, couple odd jobs, um, fell into my lap. So I had, so I worked, I was, I was working in self storage for a while there and, you know, just, just the familiarity you, you get with staying in what, with one property type is, so much is so much better than for me for me personally and I, I think some other people can relate to this too is is it's is so much better than hopping around to different property types you know yeah. i could i could do you know i'd be doing a, a medical office 
um, or a dentist, a dental office in, you know, a county, some, you know, a few counties over and, you know, it's a decent job to work on, but am I ever going to use any of that information for anything that else that I'm going to work on? Probably not. So you're just, you know, to, to, to specialize in something and to know that the information you're using is going to be, you know, you're going to be able to use for more jobs in the future, or you're mm. going to be able to, you know, keep, keep, um, it, it pays forward and, you know, and, and to do a better job on that, on, on those, you know, it will reflect better on your reports. Um, so, you know, when I, I, when I was at the smaller firm, I, I made a transition to Collier's um, and at Collier's, they have a really strong MHP, um, a really strong mm -hmm. MHP presence. Um, and the, it was kind of by happen chance, you know, that, that there, there, there was a, a, um, an appraiser that had just left the firm and she was kind of specializing in that, in that property type as she left. And so it was kind of, a, it was just available. And I was like, yeah, and, and it wasn't, it wasn't um, a massive amount of work at the time, but you know, when I, once I, once I kind of got out and inspected a few and, and, and got to know a couple of the owners, I, you know, I was real comfortable with the property type and there didn't seem to be very many people specializing in it. Um, it was, it was really in my, in my state, there was, it was kind of the firms that were doing um, MHC or RV park work, um, you know, we're just kind of, they weren't, they weren't, there wasn't a specialist in the state. So I kind of, you know, there, there's actually a couple of specialists in other states that were coming into Washington. And that was one of the, one of the opportunities I saw. I was like, well, Hey, there should be a, there should be a, an expert in state, you know, that's like living in yeah. these areas that understands them more than, than somebody coming from out of state in here. So that was, that was kind of how I got a footing there and getting to know the owners of the properties um, developing relationships with the lenders who, who were experienced in this space and, and, you know, wanted to continue lending and were, you know, looking for somebody that, that could be their boots on the ground and, 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 and learn the market, um, you know, on a, on a more substantial level. Yeah. And are, are you, so you kind of mentioned, are you just focused in your state or are you kind of going all over and are, and when you get your license, are you allowed to go to other States or are you only to the States that you're licensed in? So you're only allowed to work in the states that you're licensed in. So I was initially only licensed in Washington, and then I expanded to Idaho and Alaska. Um, mm. But you know, most firms, most firms, larger firms have like are, are regionally based. They'll have a regional office, um, and so you're kind of you're kind of restrained by like the the typically typically just your state. But mm. I mm -hmm. I ended up. Um, you know, I worked at when I worked at JLL, I became the national practice leader there. So I was overseeing nice. their um, their entire the entire country while I was there. So I ended up getting licensed in 17 states, which I wow. still have all of those states now. A couple yeah. of them I need to renew, but um, that uh, we're, we're we're working on that right now. <laughs> but um, so when I so when I came back over to when I when I came over to CBRE, they they had hired me to do. Um, to over they had they had not previously had a specialty practice um for mhc it was more you know kind of focused on the core for retail um industrial multifamily um office so they hadn't really they hadn't really dedicated the resources to having a national a national team uh for mhc or rv park so that's why they brought me over um so now i'm at i'm there and i'm overseeing the entire country but I work with, you know, I work with local, local appraisers in most markets, you know, people that are, that are experienced in MHC and, and RV park and, you know, mm -hmm. or, or, you know, learning them, learning them further, you know, I'm, 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 I'm teaching a lot of, 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 of appraisers, kind of the, the methodology on, on, on how we do these and, and, and our approaches. And it's so I, so I, so to answer your question, I, I work all over the country, um, but you do need to get, you do need to get licensed in each state or you can get a lot of states will will let you get a reciprocal license or license or a temp license um, per job, um, so you can kind of go that route. But that can be costly, um, okay. and, and you know the, the states that I that I end up working in more, where I'm actually writing the reports, I I, I like to be licensed in those. Got it. And <clears throat> I'm I'm guessing uh, what well you're not guessing what let me ask you what is the majority of the business is it new purchase is a refinance is it uh individuals that just want to kind of figure out what the value of the park is what's the majority of your of your business 
Well, since the, you know, since the interest rates went up quite a bit, the, um, the refinance uh, business in the last couple of years has gone down. Like, yeah. you know, we just saw numbers on it at a, at a fall conference. Those numbers have gone down quite a bit. Um, it, they haven't evaporated. Um, there's people are kind of holding, holding back and waiting to see, you know, where the market's going or trying to make sense of sense of things, which we're still trying to make sense of. Um, so the refinance has gone down quite a bit right now, but it has picked up that is, it has picked up in the last a uh, couple months uh, since interest rates have gone down a little bit. Um, a lot of pending sales. Um, we do we do do a lot of state planning uh, type of assignments. That's definitely part of it. We we love those we love those assignments too. Um, you know, so it's kind of it kind of comes from all three. Um, but I'd say the majority right now would be. Uh, I mean, it's probably split between refinances and pending sales okay. right now. Yeah. yeah. How many mobile home park appraisals do you think you've done? Have I done? Um, yeah, or so, in, like you and everybody that you walked over. Oh, like, that, I've, that, I've, that I've, how many I've like overseen? Uh, Gosh, no. man, I mean, it could be like 1,500. That's a um, lot. Around That's a lot. that, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, when I, I yeah, that, probably something, around, I could be low on that like too, um, okay. you know. Yeah, that is, that's just a function of how experienced you are. So if anybody's listening, it's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there, I mean, you know, once you know, once 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 you get your name out, name out there, and people you know kind of recognize that you you understand the um the property type, it's it, you can you definitely can you know it starts it can start snowballing for sure for sure, and you can start and 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 then, and it is to do that kind of volume, you definitely need to work in more than just your your home state because there's just there's just there's not you know, too many as you know there's the zoning yeah. a lot of zoning will, won't even allow new pro, new uh manufactured housing communities so there's not yeah. a lot of new ones it seems like the the, the um, supply is always going down a little bit as some some get redeveloped um so yeah there's there's um there that's kind of an issue too thanks I'm curious, what is uh, what kind of tools or publications are you following or looking at to stay informed of the the MHC or the manufacturing home community? Um, basically, you know, a lot of just looking for articles online. There's always, you know, Forbes will have articles. Sometimes um, Bloomberg will have articles that 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 um, that uh, you know will will cover cover the markets. There's like Census.org. Um, mm -hmm. does some good info has some good information on um, like MH MH shipments um, R RVIA is another good one for RV uh, RV shipments mm -hmm. and kind of following the industry they're they're pretty good um, there's a few others that I'm, I'm probably skipping then there's a lot of brokerages actually like um, a lot of brokerages that uh, that that put out um, you know quarterly reports that are really really valuable for sure yeah. So yep. you know, finding finding brokers that um, that are really active in this space, they usually will do kind of a promotional type um, quarterly quarterly report that um, that you can really you can get a lot of really good information from. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and then, I mean, for those who are new into this industry, what is kind of the process and the steps that you are taking to come up with the value? for a park what what is it uh, on a high level i know you can go there's so many different little intricate pieces to it but kind of more on a high level what is it you're looking at and then maybe we can go into more of the intricate stuff yeah so i mean the the big thing for uh mhc is you know what what cap rate are you are you going to go with and there's a lot of things that that influence that um some of the some of the big ones that i think about when i'm choosing a cap rate are the size of the community. Well, well first off, the, the location of the community. You know, is it close to, um, you know, any major arterials or freeways? Uh, you know, employment opportunities. Um, you know, medical medical um, services. Um, you know, commercial services. So, you know, knowing if it, how close it is to those, like what what is the what is the um, you know, what are homes selling for in that market? Like how many, how many parks are in the area? What is the, you know, what is the occupancy of your park? Um, you know, if, if it's not full, like what are the, what's the occupancy of the other parks in your, in your markets? Um, you know, is it, is it because the owner's not, you know, not filling space up, you know, or maybe they don't have the resource, maybe they don't have the resources to bring in new mm -hmm. homes. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a big part of it too. And that's kind of, you know, one of the opportunities that a lot of the regional and national, buyers look at, you know, is this a kind of a mom and pop owner who, 
you know, filled up the park to a point where they're in the black and they're, and they're doing okay, but they maybe don't have the motivation to fill it the rest of the way. Um, yep. You know, those that can put, you know, that can be influential on the cap rate. Um, you know, a, a big one too is, uh, you know, is the park, are the homes at the park owned by the tenants or are they owned by the, the owner of the uh, community? Um, Cause this, it's kind of, it's a different ball game. Uh, where if the, if all the homes are owned by the, um, the community, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost like a, a rental it's, it, well, it's, it is, it's a rental community. Um, and it's, it's more akin to an apartment or, um, or townhome rental community where mm -hmm. the spaces are more susceptible to vacancy than if you are, are to sell a home to a tenant, you know, they own the home and it's on the rented lot. If they do want to vacate or they do want to, you know, move, it's, it's, it's on them to come up with the cost to uh, move the home or, you know, maybe even sell it back to the, sell it back to the landlord who can resell it. So you're kind of in a, you're in a, you're in a, um, you're in a strong position if you're selling all the homes to the tenants from a standpoint of it's less management for you. Um, mm -hmm. You know, once you've absorbed space and you've brought in homes and you've sold them to tenants, that, 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 um, that, that occupancy there is so much stronger than renting the manufactured homes. You know, you get it, you know, with good management, you bring it up to stabilization, you know, you're probably going to stay there unless there's some, you know, outside yeah. force or just misman some sort of mismanagement that would that would bring it down or the homes become so you know dilapidated that um you know they're the, 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 you know they could be abandoned but um you know so so you know if you've got the park filled with tenant owned homes you've that's going to put a lot of downward pressure on the cap rate because the income stream is going to be you know really really strong mm -hmm. and lot, one of the questions i get quite often when i'm underwriting deals is you know, what is the, uh, what's the cap rate in there? What's the kind of going cap rate? Do you yeah. have any quick, simple tools that you use to kind of figure out what is, you know, other parks have sold for, you know, what's kind of the going cap rate for that asset class? Because, as you know, and I know there's not a lot of information on, on cap rates for mobile home parks. Like you can easily go to like apartment loan store and you can see, uh, yeah. cap rates for multifamily, right? But there's nothing for mobile home parks. So do you have a, a tool or something that you like to use when you're finding? Well, I just, like I said, from being, from being very active in the, um, in the space, but, yeah. um, uh, you know, I have, we have lots of internal cap rate information just from the sales that we, that we work on. Mm -hmm. um, also developing relationships with brokers who, yep. um, specialize in this, in this space as well. Like they, they have, they will have great cap rate information. And, you know, as long as, as an appraiser, as long as I have something I can, I could contribute to the conversation. I mean, it's going to be a, a really positive relationship. Like I'm, I'm, I'm always for brokers and, and, and appraisers, you know, mm -hmm. working together or sharing information and kind of like helping each other as they can, because you're only going to make your, you know, it's going to make my reports better. Um, it's going to, you know, they're going to get information from me as well. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's, yeah, the cap cap rate information is it, it there's there really isn't national any strong national publications you're right especially for rv parks mhc yeah. mhc's um mhc's a little bit. You, you could find yeah <laughs> <laughs> because you know like i could i could say you know in my market you know i typically i'm gonna be between like i'll typically start between sam and the i5 i5 corridor which is like the the um the strongest market in, in the state of Washington and, and through mm -hmm. Portland and, and uh, you know, down the coast, but uh, it's because it's, it's just provides access to all the services I, you know, that I said, stronger employment opportunities and, and, and all the, all the um, um, amenities that you, that you'd need. Um, yep. So those, the parks in the, along that corridor tend to sell for, you know, a lot more than they would in Eastern Washington. Um, so, you know, I sometimes would start out when I'm just, like a, I'd start out with a cap rate somewhere in the five to 6.5 range right now. Um, whereas, you know, during COVID it was much lower, like, you know, four, sometimes below. Um, yeah, that's crazy. Um, yeah, it was, it was, <laughs> I know there was, there during that, <laughs> it was just like, I can't, I can't believe what I just saw on this, this, <laughs> but it's this next one just sold for. Um, and when you get up to those class A, um, those class A, really, really nice communities with like the gated entrance and the swimming pools. I mean, those cap rates can get down to two, um, you know, just, just really, really low. So you kind of, 
I kind of start, you know, with a baseline cap rate in a certain range. And then I'm, and then I kind of start looking at like, then I start narrowing it down based on, you know, what are the newest sales that I've, that I've found, you know, what are they telling me? Is there a reason why that one, you know, was that a 4.5? Is there, is there more of a story there to the story? And sometimes, you know, it is something like, you know, Hey, you know, you, you, you ask a few questions and you find out like, well, the rent was half of what the market is. Mm -hmm. And it also included water, sewer, and garbage service. So a savvy, you know, national, and you don't even have to be savvy to know this, but like a regional or national operator is going to look at that and say, well, the, the, you know, the rent's half the market. I've got a lot of, I've got a lot of upside on the, just on the rent, but then on also shifting the responsibility of utilities to the tenants is going to really, really increase, increase the value of this property. So they're willing to, you know, pay more push the cap rate down much lower knowing that they're going to be able to over it, the yep. course of um several you know rent increases and, and and upgrade and upgrading the property to justify these um rent increases um there's just there's a lot of upside um yeah. there's a there was a chart in um and I, and I put this in some of my reports uh, it was in um a bloomberg i believe that was showing the different sectors um and and how much they um how much uh, value they gained over a 10 year, 10 year period. And MHC was up over, I think it was around 425% over this 10 year period uh, return on investment. And it was, you know, I I think it was like 150% higher than multifamily. It was, it was way higher than even self storage. Mm. I mean, it was just because during this period, I mean, cap rates kept going down and then, you know, the, and, and, you know, as you increase rent and cap rates are going down, it just really made values explode for a while. And that's kind of flattened a little bit in the last couple of years. I wouldn't say, you know, in, in some markets, it's gone, the values have gone, you know, down a little bit, but for the, for overall, they've really, the cap rate increases over the last couple of years, it feels like have kind of been offset by the rent increases and things have kind of flat, flattened a little bit value wise on that. But, but, but values on some of these properties were getting pretty getting pretty crazy. <laughs> We're getting yeah. Crazy. Oh, yeah. yeah. I've seen a, I've seen a few. I was like, geez. Yeah. I mean, but yeah. that's California. I mean, we're in California. I know you're in Washington. Yeah. So, you know, high price well, yeah, states. Seen, <laughs> I mean, California is one of the ones I'm licensed in. I have seen, I've seen, yeah. I've seen those sales. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. It's just a different, it's a different ball game, a different uh, plan of attack when they're buying at those cap rates. Right. Cause obviously yeah, and that's, the cost and of actually, money is more than that. <laughs> yeah. And bringing up California, another thing, cause we've, that's a, a, one thing we're, we're um, dealing with in Washington is just rent, rent control in, um, in, uh, in California. And it's different in, in different counties and, and, mm-hmm. and stuff. And that one kind of, um, that kind of cools some of, some of the, um, some of some of the market but like you said i mean you know you still see like sales of you know 300,000 a site and higher um yeah. we haven't had any sales that high in washington but um you know there's definitely parks in washington that if they did they did sell i feel like they could could be at that level yeah and then back to the income and its value different obviously the tenant owned home income is the holy grail because you can count on it the most and they're not yeah. going anywhere. The park owned is probably a little bit less valuable uh, because it's like you said, just a rental. Where does rent to own fall in there? And then how do they all three like relate with each other when it comes to value? Like, are you now taking the park owned home rent more in consideration with the appraisal? Is there a percentage that you have kind of locked in in your mind? And then for the RTOs, kind of the same questions. How are you looking at that value for the rent to own homes? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, so the it really depends on what the lender is looking for. Um, most lenders, almost all of them, will not will not want you to include the income from the uh, park owned homes. They don't they don't want to lend on the park owned homes um, because they're kind of they're considered to be a rapidly depreciating asset. Um, that's one reason. Another reason is that they're not permanently affixed to the real estate. So uh, theoretically, you could loan on the on the park owned homes, and then the loan, and then the um, you know, and if you're not watching, you know, nobody's watching the park every day. But so the tenant, the uh, the owner could decide to sell those homes, and really the, the lender would be no, you know, would not would not have any knowledge of this. And so you know, he's getting there. They would be getting. 
um, you know, a loan amount on these homes that they end up selling and they didn't even, you know, so it's not even part of the, it's technically not part of the collateral. So no, there's really not a lot of um, lenders that will loan on them. So you have to exclude that income. So say, you know, for, so it's, so that's what kind of another one of the benefits of, of, you know, selling, selling to the tenant or whatever is you have that secure, you have that secure income, you have the, the, the home there um, that the tenant owns. But if you do have, a, you know, if you do own a park and you have a few X and you have a few park owned homes and e even though, yeah, and they're more susceptible to vacancy, um, you know, cause you rent them out and, and most lenders don't want to loan on them. You know, if you've got a larger park and you've got a few park owned homes, it's not a bad thing to have, you know, a few park owned homes, you know, typically you can, you can rent them, you know, for say the rent is like $500 for the site, you know, sometimes you can rent the, you know, the home and the site for, I mean, anywhere from a thousand to $1,500. So you're getting an extra thousand dollars a month. Mm -hmm. And even though the bank won't recognize that income, you're still getting that income. And I own a couple mobile home parks and I've got a, you know, a couple of a, a two or three park owned homes at, um, you know, each. And, you know, I kind of went into it saying like, Oh, we need to sell these, you know, we need, we did rent to own programs for, for a number of them. Um, and, you know, thinking that we need to sell them, but you know, the extra income can, can cover a lot of your, a lot of your expenses. Yeah, really. I mean, you know, the income from that can kind of cover like any of the maintenance, you know, regular yep. maintenance and stuff you need for the park, or, you know, you need to like replace like a septic tank or something. You've got, you're building income, extra income from these extra homes. And it really is, I mean, I think from that standpoint, I, I think it's really beneficial. And, and as an appraiser, I, if, it, if, if a community just has a few park owned homes, I may make a comment that, you know, they're more susceptible to vacancy or whatever, but I wouldn't put any pressure on the cap rates just for a few. It's more when it's, you know, you've got like 20 plus or it's, you know, making up, you know, half or a quarter of the park um, that, that could become vacant. If it's like within your typical vacancy allowance, it's not really, it's not going to impact the value of the park. And it probably will, you know, personally benefit you just from operating it. Yeah. I always found that interesting that why uh, there is any value given for the, the POH, right? Because yeah, like you mentioned, it's a, an increased uh, amount of income. So it covers one, the maintenance on that actual unit itself and two, any of the park maintenance that is needed because you are bringing in, you're generating more revenue, which yeah. is a benefit for everybody. And I don't know why banks won't, you know, there, like you said, there's a few, the rates mm -hmm. are higher in terms of a little bit different, but uh, yeah. And why they, more banks won't consider that because yeah. Yes. Yes. It's a depreciate some in some States. I, I mean, mo a lot of areas right now, would you say though, if you own a mobile home, it's appreciating and you're able to sell it usually for more than what you, you pay for. Yeah. I, I, and that's kind of, that's, that's also kind of a, um, a tricky, the tricky uh, um, a thing in appraisals is you're right. They, they, I mean, especially during COVID like 2020 to 2022, yeah. and I could not believe some of the homes that were, you know, I'd look, you know, cause I'd look, you know, you're kind of looking to sometimes they're included in the sale price and you're trying to figure out like, well, what value is attributed to the park owned homes included? Um, and some of them, you know, you'll see some of these homes and they're at the end of, you know, in the um, Marshall Swift, Marshall and Swift valuation guide, you know, give like a, a, a typical life term for these manufactured homes. And a lot of them will be, you know, well, you're beyond, beyond the mm -hmm. typical term. But, you know, with upkeep, you can extend with upkeep of the, the, the home, you could keep that you can keep that going. But the, the some of the homes, you know, selling for like one hundred thousand to one hundred and fifty thousand and they're, you know, haven't been very well maintained or, or you know, um, or whatnot. But, yeah, they, you're right. They 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 completely appreciate it in value. And that was and that was tricky because you, you you'd end up getting an assignment um, where you know, say the property was selling for a million dollars and, um, you know, you know that they didn't buy it because there's three park owned homes there. They're buying it because they're, because <laughs> cause they're, they're buying a, a manufactured housing community. But yeah. then if you look just for, at listings for manufactured homes, you'd be like, well, these could sell for 75,000 or a hundred thousand, but that would, that would, if I deducted those from the sale price, I mean, that would just, that would be such a penalty to, yeah. you know, the loan. And it, it is, it, so you kind of have to, Closing the gap on that, there's can be some, um, you know, some definitely some nuance there. Yeah.
And when you're taking these assignments uh, for the uh, appraisal, are you looking at what the operator's uh, business plan is for the park? Like you mentioned, you know, is it selling off, you know, five or six of the POH and they're going to collect say $50,000 roughly in profit. And then they're going to turn some of these to RTOs. And then, uh, you know, are you looking at the, the, the game the business plan when you're going into these? Yeah. If they, if they provide, yeah, if I'm, if I'm provided with a, a business plan, I will, you know, you, you almost, you can kind of almost test the feasibility of the business plan, you know, based mm -hmm. on other, other similar properties we've appraised in the area or even, you know, more regionally or nationally and kind of test, test, you te can test the feasibility of it. Um, and then, and then um, kind of make, you know, you know, make your value, you know, kind of value. Cause we, we do a lot, we do a lot of, um, do a lot of pro pro properties that are proposed. Like I, I know I said before, there's not been a lot of MHCs, but there's been, there has been a lot of RV park, um, mm -hmm. RV park, um, uh, proposed builds. RV parks across the country that we've worked on. And there's a lot, that, a lot of times, you know, we'll get their business plan that they, you know, when they're trying to get investors in, involved in and that's, that'll be part of the appraisal process. Yeah. And, and that's always, that's, that's great. And I mean, that's just invaluable information uh, to give to anytime you can give more information to the appraiser. Um, I don't want to say you want to guide them towards what you, you know, but like, if you have a business plan in mind and you're like, this is what we think the rents are. And, and you're like, these are the properties that we looked at for, how we came up with our rent and blah, 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 you know, you know, cause you, you could, you could end up, you know, you know, end up, end up with a, a, an appraiser who does not work in, in manufactured housing very much. And you want to, and in that instance, you know, you really want to give them as much information that you've been working on mm -hmm. at up front, And, you know, it's easier to do it that way than to get the appraisal and be like, how did they miss this? How did they miss this? Like I, you know, yeah. I, I, you know, then, then try to go through the bank and then, you know, there's, that's just, that's more of a battle that you can get, you can get in front of that too. So I would, you know, getting yeah. an appraiser as much information and just staying in communication with them too, um, is, is really key. Um, you know, cause an appraiser, you know, is typically working on, you know, I know that there's kind of a mindset that the appraiser is just, this is, they're probably just working on this assignment for me right now, but, um, but if you do the do the math, the appraisers have to work on many assignments, many assignments at the same time to kind yep. of um, to make to make things work. So um, yeah, keeping in communication and just kind of do, checking in and and you know providing them with information, comps that you that you think are 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 good. That's that's to your benefit. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I never think I never consider that. You know, some people will say that's trying to influence the appraisal process, but I never. I never look at it that way either. I mean, I, I, I assume that, that an owner is going to want to try to influence the <laughs> appraisal process to their benefit. So it's, it's not, I mean, and it's not, I, I totally understand. So. It's not. Yeah. And it opens up ideas. I mean, like you said, it's the more people, more information being shared, you know, it helps everybody. Right. So if you have yeah. an operator that says, Hey, look, they're looking at it this way. Well, maybe that's a new perspective in the appraiser's eyes like yourself. And I mean, you've probably seen it all, but you know, for an appraiser, just to say. Not, not all. I always, I still, I still see new things. <laughs> all right. That's funny. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I get that. And it's, it's it, I think that's a valuable just presenting what as the operator, what you're seeing for the vision for the park and how you're going to get there. I think that's super valuable, but yeah. And most, and most of the people, you know, the, most of the experience, I mean, the, the, the experienced regional and national buyers, you know, they all, they all have that, like, you know, that, you know, packet of, you know, information and tons, they all, I'm usually presented with more information than I'd ever need. And, and it's, it, I mean, I, I love that. And I, and I love getting new, I love getting new sales information too. So I yeah. always uh, appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. So what do you, what are you, would you say you see as the uh, kind of a common mistake for new operators in the in the mhc space mhp space um when you're going to evaluate a park and you see that you know what's the most common thing you see people missing if they're new to the business i think uh one of the things that i would you know the values on 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 these parks really shot up over i you know like i said over you know the the, the chart that i was talking about in bloomberg was was 2010 to 2020 um and even, you know, 2020 to up till, you know, the end of 2022, that just the mm -hmm. values were just shooting up on these things. So there's a lot of people 
that I think right now probably own parks that they were thinking like, you know, cha-ching, cha-ching. <laughs> like I got it. And then they're actually to a degree, they're, they're hard. It's, it's, it's even hard to, you know, get your, get a footing in this, in this space. You know, I have people all the time come up to me. It's like, Hey, you know, let me know if you, let me know if there's a, a mobile home park I can, you know, I can buy. I'm thinking about investing in one. I was like, well, when I mean, you're probably like <laughs> down to down the list, <laughs> pretty far down the list right now. But, uh, you know, it, they're, they're hard, they're, they're hard to acquire. I mean, it just, just even to find one that works um, mm -hmm. and, you know, to get your footing in the, in this space, you may need to take on a park that a lot of the, you know, knowing that a lot of the, you're, if one's going to get to you as it's the first park, um, you know, you could be in a fortunate situation that you got a good, you got a great opportunity that kind of landed you, or maybe you're, you're already involved in real estate and, and you, and, and you've got your privy to a couple of good opportunities, but if you're just coming in like your first property, you're probably going to have to take on, you know, one with a lot of hair on it. Like it's going to have, you know, mm -hmm. maybe some tenant issues, just, you know, tenant issues, um, issues with the infrastructure. There's going to be reasons why this didn't land with one of the, you know, really active borrowers, um, you know, cause those guys, cause those folks, they, you know, there's lots of pocket deals that happen in this, in this space where it's, yep. they don't, these, these properties, a lot of times don't even make it to market. They'll just bro, go to one of their preferred buyers and be like, Hey, this is what we're planning on listing it for. What do you think? And, and by, especially, especially during COVID, I keep saying this, like that, that you wouldn't, nobody would even see this, this park before I'm, I'm appraising it for a sale. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, so there's a lot of there's a lot of a lot of work that will go into owning a community at first, and um, I think that that can be a little daunting for people once they kind of that kind of sinks in. Like, yes, the value can go up quite a bit, even just from you know a rent increase or two. But there's also a lot of moving parts. You know, a lot of things you can't just raise rent on people and then you know not fix up the community or not do any improvements. Um, you know, there's a lot of there's just there, there, there's a lot of pro there's a lot of, not problems there's a lot of there's just a lot of a lot of things that you need to you need to be aware of and you're not going to be making much, you know with this, especially with the smaller parts you're not going to be you know you're not going to be able to quit your day job during the um during the, <laughs> a couple of the smaller parks you know there you know once you go to you know sell it or refinance the, the the value that goes up you know can be can be considerable but you know that's a little ways off and there's a lot of work that needs to be put into um, yep. to fix it up and make and make the park run and and uh, yeah, you don't just snap your fingers and get the um, the um, <laughs> the value. <laughs> yeah, they're not they're not the hands off mailbox money cash cows that uh, has been depicted over the years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Until you know, and until you you kind of are farther along and you acquire more and more, but there's, it's a lot. Of, it is it's still a lot of work. It doesn't just it just it doesn't just happen overnight. Um, yeah. How did yeah. you get into? You said you own a few parks. How, when did you, uh, when did that happen? When did you make the transition to being an owner? Are you operating it personally? How, how does that work? Yeah. So in like 20, in 2019, um, you know, just from knowing, just from knowing brokers, um, and, uh, and there was a, a broker that we, that I was working with on, um, it was, it was kind of, it was kind of funny. Like I, so as a broker, I was, I, I was working on a, on a couple things with, and he, um, he, um, you know, he had, had brought a, a one park up to uh, one park to my attention and said, hey, you know, was asking, asking if I knew any, anybody that was looking at, 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 at buying one. And, um, and I did bring it to actually to a couple of, um, a couple of the park owners that I knew. I was like, Hey, this might be this opportunity here. And it was out of, and like, like I said, it was out of, um, it was out of the, um, typical area that, that these bigger operators, wanted to work in, you know, they kind of want it. We're looking to add properties, but closer to ones they already own. That's another, you know, another, another kind of trick is like, Hey, I own this park here. It's like, yeah, this will then this other 20 space park right in town makes sense because I got economy of scale. I can use the same management to, to, to run across. So this opportunity kind of presented itself. And then I had, I, I own it with a, with a business partner and uh, he's a, he's a physician and he was, you know, we were at a, a dinner party and he's like, yeah, I've been listening to these, mobile home park investing podcast. And I was like, well, I was like, wow, that's uh, I was like, Hey, we should talk because uh, you know, it got, that's basically how it, how it kind of, uh, how it kind of snowballed. And then, so he, so he and I bought this one park um, in 2019. And then this has happened. I've seen this happen with other, other folks too. 
you know, there's another park owner in town. It was like, oh, you just closed on that park. Well, we'd sell our park too. Um, and, you know, then we ended up acquiring that one. And, you know, we actually even had a couple of more opportunities beyond that in the same town. Um, mm -hmm. And they didn't end up panning out, but, but it really, it really kind of, you know, once, once, once you've kind of developed a reputation to be able to close deals or you're, you know, you're, you know, you, you can do it. Like people will, you know, people may seek you out. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of yeah. how that, that went. And I do, yeah, I do still operate them. Um, my partner and I do, um, we have like an on-site manager for, for both the parks. Cause they're, they're like four hours drive across the mountains, uh, from us. So we can't, you know, be there every day. So we've got somebody over there that we can trust now, but that was another thing that was difficult, um, is finding management that we could trust and, you know, be our eyes on the ground there. Cause we did try, you know, there's a couple, you know, there's just a couple trials and errors, you know, with, with folks that, that didn't yeah. end up working out. And it was, it was definitely a process. I think we're in a good position now, but, but um, it was, it was, it was a challenge. And so, you know, we took the opportunity knowing it wasn't, you know, Hey, I'd love to own another park right in town. That would be ideal. Um, but, you know, this is the opportunity that we have and like, let's see what we can do with it. Yeah. I think that's the most common, uh, issue people have, I think in, in owning parks and you probably hear the same thing is just the management side of stuff, right? Just make sure yeah. you have the right managers. Cause as we all know, the, the personnel in any business, really like your personnel, your employees can make or break your business. And Absolutely. So you got to have the right people. Um, switching gears a little bit into the RV park side, uh, cause our listeners are both in mobile park and RV park. And so, so are we, but, um, yeah. What's the difference now when you're looking at RV parks and, and praising those? What are the things you're looking at there? So RV parks, you know, there's there's a lot of different trends happening in the RV spark, RV park space now. I mean, you're getting mm -hmm. a lot of the glamping, glamping yep. communities that are being developed. We've been doing a lot of proposed um, parks, uh, you know, with nicer high end, um, you know, tiny homes or tiny, um, you know, like smaller cabins that are really modern um, and really mm -hmm. slick looking. Um you know, there, so there, there, there's, it was, it was really one of the crazier things during, um, you know, the COVID uh, crisis was when at the very beginning, like in, in my state, all the RV parks were like shut down for a little while. And I was, I was kind of scared at first when that happened, thinking like, oh, well, are RV parks going to go the way of like movie, you know, um, yeah. you know, outdoor movie theaters or um, dri your drive in movie theaters? Are they, you know, I, I, you know, it's kind of wondering, like, is this, is this popular with Gen Z or, or, you know, how, how would this, you know, to buy an RV, they're like, they can be like a hundred thousand dollars and plus, like, who, how do you get into that? How do you get into this? Like, what's going to happen with it? And yep. it was, it was really, it was really uh, crazy how, how much they exploded in popularity um, through that, uh, through that COVID crisis. And, 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 you know, it's dipped down definitely in the yeah. last year. Or so, yep. or whatever the 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 fervor, but but you know they're still really popular. Um, you know, with Gen Z and um, millennials, like they they're really really popular. You know, the rental renting RVs and going to different um, you know hopping around to different properties. More folks are living in RV parks now. It's like an, mm -hmm. it's a viable alternative living uh, living. You know, you know sometimes it's the, it's the only affordable living option in an area. Um, you know, really affordable. Um, yeah. So there's a lots of, you know, one trend we're seeing is, is, is parks transitioning from being an eyes, either like an overnight park or a destination park to a full on extended stay, um, full-time living community, like um, a manufactured housing community. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, with the tenant owned homes or the, or the park owned homes, they're more susceptible to vacancy well, the RV parks are more susceptible to vacancy too, in the same way that like there's no barriers to exit. An RV, an RVer can be, you know, you raise the monthly rent on them, and they'll be like, you know what, I'm just gonna drive out of here and I'm gonna go <laughs> go down to go down to another park. But you know, in some of these, in a lot of these markets, there's such demand that if somebody drives off, they can have somebody new in there, you know, within the next few days. Yeah. Um, so they're, you know. The, that's one of the trends is some of these transitioning to extended stay or having longer term, whereas uh, whereas before you'd have a destination park, 
maybe a few monthlies. And then in the off season, they maybe bring in some monthlies to just kind of, you know, cover, cover expenses and stuff through, through the off season and then boot everybody back out and be back to, uh, you know, the dailies and weeklies. But um, yeah, there's definitely a shift where um, it's, it, it's become, you know, affordable housing in, in, in a lot of markets. I've seen that. I see that a lot in Washington, especially, and up, up, mm -hmm. actually up and down the coast. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's gotta be probably pretty difficult to figure out the values of when you're dealing with, uh, short-term stays, glamping cabins, and then you got some RV long-term stays here and some RV short-term stays and, and all these other different mixes of, uh, hospitality plays. So are you, how are you looking at all these different things? Are you just basically looking at what's the obviously rates? What, you know, how do you determine, you know, Hey, a tent site's going to be this or a glamping dome is going to be this. How are you figuring all that stuff out? Just calling around other campgrounds and parks? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question because, you know, you know, you can say, especially with just, just looking at the RV sites, you know, you know, you know, typically, uh, or in one, in one example, I go in and they could say, well, 75% of our park is for daily and weekly guests, but 25% is for monthlies. And typically I, I, I wouldn't go in and then try to divide the two and be like, well, 25% is for you know monthly so i'm gonna i'm gonna analyze that based on monthly people who rent monthly rvs and the rest i'll, I'll analyze that i'll analyze based on daily and weekly weekly rates mm -hmm. the reason I, why i wouldn't do that is because if i if i come in for an inspection of an rv park the occupancy fluctuates so much and the dynamic of the rv sites i mean it could be different by the time i leave like people could leave you know people could leave you know leave the site <laughs> leave the property yeah. check out you know, it, it, it it's it's really that's kind of up to the owner about how they're owning it or how they're running it. Um, so you'll typically want to pin down an average daily rate for the community, and you want it, and you want to figure out the economic occupancy for the property, which is different than the physical occupancy. And you know, one an example I use in my reports would be if you have one site and you're renting it for five hundred dollars a month, but you could rent it for $50 a day, you know, physically it's hundred percent occupied for the month, but economically you could have made $1,500, you know, 30 times 50. Um, but you're renting it for 500. So the economic occupancy is 33%. Mm -hmm. Um, and that can be really tricky that, you know, nailing down the economic occupancy can be really tricky because you can't really, as an appraiser call, other RV park, you know, if you call, if you call in other RV park owners, you know, you're usually going to get there to their front desk and, and whoever's the manager of the front desk is not going to know. I there's, I can't explain to them in a quick enough phone call that I can get an answer that, that would be, <laughs> you know, uh, satisfactory. That, yeah. That, yeah. I can't be like, Hey, what's your economic occupancy for the year? They're, they're probably going to be like, uh -huh. no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. I've, been hung up on, I've been hung up, hung up on a lot. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, um, you know, you kind of, you kind of have to, um, you know, a, a one way you can look at it is you just look at their effective gross income, like how much, potentially, you know, yeah, how much, it, so their potential gross income is what you would come up with on, you know, what's the difference between their potential gross income if every site was rented at the maximum amount, which we all know would never be, you know, is not, is not achievable, but for, yeah. for, uh, Matt, for purposes of appraisal purposes, you kind of come up with that number. And then you're like, well, what is the difference between their effective gross income and that, you know, like if that was, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it can be, that can be so wildly, that is all over the map. That's why like whenever, you know, with MHC, it's, almost, it's easier to talk cap rates than with RV parks because RV parks, the cap rates mm -hmm. on those are just, all over the place. I mean, they can be anywhere from as low as four to like 18. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, yeah. It, it is, it is wild, you know, depending on if they're, if they're able to open, you know, be open all year round. Um, you know, yeah. some of them, some of them will just rent, you know, their spaces for the full season. Um, they just have a seasonal rate. Um, yeah. There's just different, different ways you can operate it. Yeah. Yep. So Andy, we are, we're approaching about an hour here. Do appreciate your time. Can people hire you just as an individual and let's say not through if they're getting a new loan, but they want to kind of know if they're buying the right part. Cause let's say it's seller financing, right? 
are they able to hire you to appraise that even if it's not through bank financing? Yeah, absolutely. I do. Yes, I do that all the time. I've uh, I've appraised um I've appraised properties between a buyer and a seller to come up with a sale price. Um, you know that both both sides agreed. You know, agreed mm-hmm. to this, and so I've had that. That's that's pretty satisfactory. That's that's satisfying to come up to help come up with a sale price mm-hmm. in that regard. But also, you know, you know, I've had people you know thinking about buying a park say, "Hey, can you look at this and um you know tell me what you think?" And and you know I've been hired for that type of work. Um, litigation work. I've, I've, I've done that. Um, you know, they can definitely, and I'm, I'm, and I'm always available too if people want to call me and, you know, Hey, you know, maybe looking for some guidance, you know, for a certain market, if there's information I'm able to share, I'm happy to, you know, share my insights or, you know, a couple sales and, and kind of, and, and, and help. I'm all, I'm, I'm always willing to do that when I, you know, I'm busy like everybody, but, um, but, you know, um, I'm always willing to help. For sure. Yeah. And I, I can, we can contest to that because you've helped us answer questions and stuff. So we do appreciate that. So how can people Absolutely. get a hold of you and hire you if they, if they need to? Well, it can be reached at Andrew period Chapman at CBRE.com. That's my email address. Um, so you can always reach me there. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, Andrew Chapman. Um, I should pop up if you put CBRE in. Um, yeah, those are, those are probably the two best, the best places to, to reach me. I think. Yeah. Perfect. And any other uh, words of advice before uh, dropping off here? Um, I don't. I don't think so. I just. I would. Um, yeah. Not necessarily. I think. I think this is still. I think manufactured housing may have like cooled off a little bit in the last couple of years, but I still think it's a hugely. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, it's a, it's a very still a very attractive sector. Um, I think there's mm-hmm. kind of. Um, there's there's some of, some of the some of the um the a lot of the people that were jumped in in 2020 may have kind of cooled off. So there may be a lot of opportunities that, that out there right now where, um, you know, don't be afraid of, 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 you know, some of the work that, that with, with, um, some of these parks that look, may look like they're, they've got too much work to do, you know, too much work to make, to make, um, to turn or turn around. But you know what, if you do the value, um, yeah, is, is, is definitely there. And one, one last question, are you MHC or are you RV? What one do you like better? Um, I was showing you I like, well, I like them both. <laughs> I like the, I like the, I like when they combine the both MHC RVs. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Both of, uh, yeah, no, yeah, I, 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 honestly, yeah. I equally, I equally like both. I nice. like to stay, I like to kind of change it up just a little bit. Yeah. Very cool. Well, Andy, yeah. thank you for your time and sharing your knowledge and, uh, we appreciate what you've helped us with. And, uh, we look forward to working with you down the road and thanks for coming on the show. Absolutely. Thank you. I'd be happy to come back anytime you guys would like to have me. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. You bet.